Many of my long-term subscribers are aware that one of the metrics that I use to assess the valuation of gold is to use the gold to oil ratio. It's a pretty good tool to have in the toolkit because as is shown here, the ratio tends to be range bound. Gold is tended to be priced anywhere between 10 barrels of oil to the ounce, where gold is relatively cheap, to 25 barrels per ounce or more, where gold is relatively expensive. Note that I say relative here because the value of any real tangible item can always be compared to another real tangible item, in this case, oil. This is an important point to make because the gold to oil ratio is a much better indicator of whether gold will be a good way to preserve purchasing power than it is a means of predicting the movement of the price of gold in dollar terms. A case in point is the year 1980 when gold hit a relative peak in terms of its dollar price uh, where the gold to oil ratio was on the low end of its range. Despite gold's relative attractiveness compared to other commodities, its price declined due to the rapid spike in interest rates caused by Paul Volcker, which caused the demand for dollars uh, relative to gold to climb. For the most part, I've shown in many of my videos that the gold to oil ratio can be a pretty reliable indicator of whether it is a good time to buy gold or a good time to consider other possible safe havens for your wealth. With that said, we need to consider the current level of the gold to oil ratio and ask ourselves the question, what is it telling us now? Is the relatively high ratio of the gold price to the oil price telling us that gold is expensive? Or is it more a reflection that oil is relatively cheap? Let's explore this question. Let's take a look at five of the most important commodities in the world. Here I'm plotting the relative declines in the dollar price of oil, coal, gold, silver, and copper from the end of 2011 until now. Of all of the commodities, we can see that oil sticks out like a sore thumb. By far, its price has declined the most, having come down 63%. The steep decline is a combination of many factors. It includes the impact of general commodity price weakness caused by a slowing global economy. It includes the impact of a strengthening dollar in the face of an ongoing debt crisis. It also includes the impact of an exploding speculative shale oil business where billions of dollars were invested without any financial discipline to guide that investment. Dr. Copper and coal have had a much smaller decline in price. Coal declined by 37% and copper declined by 39%. These declines are much more reflective of what happened to commodities in general due to the strengthening dollar and due to global economic weakness. As a point of reference, the continuous commodity index has declined by 35% over the same time frame. So the super weakness in the price of oil is due to all of the extra supply coming online at the worst possible time. We'll explore this more on the next slide. We can also see that gold has held up pretty well. It's down 33%, which is about in line with the continuous commodity index, which was down to 35% and better than either coal or copper. We can see that silver did pretty poorly. It's down 52%. Part of the reason for the underperformance of silver is that there was quite a bit of speculative froth in silver leading up to a peak in early 2011. A good portion of the froth was worked off in the latter portion of 2011, but it still had a ways to go to catch down to other commodities. Let's take a look at some different data to highlight some of these relative price changes. For all of the commodities listed on the previous slide, I'm showing here the spread between the near-month futures price and the price of the futures one year out. This gives us an idea of how much of a discount a user of a commodity will receive if the user is willing to take delivery immediately. In general, buying and taking delivery immediately will be cheaper than taking delivery later. The reason for this is that the seller of the futures contract will generally need to warehouse material, and that will result in storage costs, insurance costs, and other costs incurred for keeping the commodity rather than delivering it. This condition in the futures market is known as contango. The greater the contango, the more it will cost to have someone else store the commodity for you. The opposite condition is backwardation. When a commodity is backward dated, it signals a tightness in the market where the producer is willing to provide a discount to the buyer if the buyer is willing to wait for delivery. When we look at oil on the left hand side of the chart, 
we can see that we did have some tightness in 2011 and 2013. In 2012, the market was in moderate contango. But look what happened when the shale industry started to ramp up production significantly. In 2014, we had a contango of greater than 10%, and currently we have a contango of over 20%. And the shale plays continue to pump. I explained in my video titled The Process of Capital Destruction why they are likely to continue to produce until many of the players are forced to declare bankruptcy. Just note that currently there is so much supply that the producers are willing to offer those who are willing to take delivery now a 20% lower price than those who want to wait. There is so much oil that storage space is at a premium, which is why we are hearing reports of oil tankers sitting outside of Galveston full of oil with nowhere to go. Coal, we can see, has been a relatively normal market for the past few years with a contango ranging between 5 and 10%. The reason for the large contango has more to do with storage costs than it does with economic weakness. Coal is simply a very bulky item and it costs a lot to store it. And that large cost is passed along to those who contract to take delivery at a later time. Of all the commodities, gold has the smallest and most stable spread. This is no coincidence. That is because gold is money, as I've discussed in my other videos. It will always have a small spread because it's value dense and there is a very large above ground stock relative to the rate of production. In general, the cost to warehouse gold will be about half a percent per year. Silver is similar to gold. Though it is primarily used in industry, there is also a very large above ground stock relative to production. It, like gold, is also very value dense and cheap to store. So it tends to always be uh, in a small contango as well. One thing that's interesting to note though is that the spread in late 2011 was about 0.7%, but the spread now is about twice that level at 1.4%. It's nowhere near as bad as the situation in oil, but it does indicate that silver is not in a supply deficit. It's more an indication that the extra silver that is being produced as a byproduct of other metal production needs to find a home in storage and the owners need to pony up more cash to free up the storage space that would otherwise be used for other purposes. In fact, it's interesting that the storage cost for silver is similar to that of copper right now. One would expect with copper being so much less value dense than silver that its cost of storage would be higher. The futures market is indicating otherwise, pointing to silver being more abundant than copper from the standpoint of relative demand. Okay, so I think we've seen that oil is in an extraordinary circumstance right now, a circumstance which will eventually resolve itself, but not for a few years. How do we know whether or not it is safe to buy gold and silver here? Well, one way is to take a look at how profitable it is to produce additional gold and silver. If we take a look at the XAU, which is a stock index consisting of a basket of major gold and silver producers, we can see that it is just a hair lower than when the great bull move in gold and silver started in 2001. As a point of reference, I overlaid the chart of the Central Fund of Canada here, which is a fund that stores physical gold and silver in a 50-50 weighting. So, despite gold and silver being more than three times their price now than in the year 2001, the XAU hasn't moved. What this means to me is that at current price levels, the mines are having just as much trouble making profit now as they were in 2001. Sure, some of the failure of the mining industry can be attributed to poor practices such as high grading, stock dilution, and poorly executed hedges but I think that the divergence has more to do with dollar devaluation than anything else. When we take a look at most other commodities, their price is much higher now than 15 years ago. So with that in mind, we know that the mines in general have the same prospects as they did in 2001. If the prices of gold and silver decline from here, it is likely that production will be taken offline. This doesn't mean that the price of gold and silver can't go below where they are now. After all, gold production only adds 1.5% per year to the above ground stock, and silver production adds not that much more than that. 
But the large above ground stocks tend to be very tightly held, especially in the case of gold. So I'm going to go out on a limb here and suggest that although we might see some further weakness in the price of gold and silver, any further drop is likely to be modest. Rather than gold and silver catching down to oil, I think that what we're likely to see are a couple of years of sideways price grind while the world waits for the inevitable bankruptcies of the shale companies, followed by oil resuming its upward price climb. For those of you who missed the move in the first decade of the century, I think you're being given a second chance now. The coming years should be interesting.